This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining me today is Jungian analyst, Dr. James Shearer. A native of northern Minnesota, he attended the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where he graduated with a doctorate in dental surgery in 1967. He later went on to study at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich, earning a diploma in analytical psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst, in 1986. Since then, he has been in private practice in Hartford, Connecticut. For many years, he has conducted seminars for the Connecticut Association for Jungian Psychology. His current series, a study of C.G. Jung's The Red Book, held every Saturday morning in West Hartford, has been ongoing for two years. His upcoming lecture series, with fellow Jungian analyst and frequent guest of this podcast, J. Gary Sparks, is titled The Meaning of the Red Book Today and will be held in West Hartford this spring. Today's topic emerged from a question I had been asked, is Jung still relevant today? I then happened across a page on the Connecticut Association of Jungian Psychology's website, Why is Jung Important to Our Times? So I've asked Dr. Shearer to discuss that with me here today. This interview is being recorded on Friday, December 14th, 2018, through the magic of Skype. Hello, Dr. Shearer. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. So you know Gary Sparks. And Very well. You, yeah, and you also know Daryl Sharp because the three of you were training at the same time together in Zurich. That's correct. Now, Daryl got there before both Gary and I, okay. so so he was more or less at the tail end of his time in Zurich when I arrived. Mm -hmm. Gary arrived in Zurich about a year before I did, and uh, so he was there for a, a, f a few years uh, while I was there, and um, and I was going back and forth to begin with after my uh, initial visit in about 76 or 77 uh, with my family, and I would go back then and practice dentistry and return to Zurich for a month or two and go back and practice dentistry for another year and so on, till finally I ended up in Zurich more or less permanently to finish my studies, um, I think that must have been in uh, about 1976 or 77. So you were practicing as a dentist in Minnesota. And, and in Switzerland. And in Switzerland, okay. That's how I supported myself when I was in Switzerland, staying to do the work at the, at the Institute for a number of years. I was lucky enough to get a job as a dentist with a, um, a retired dentist up in a mountain town called Eindiedeln. Oh, yes. And that's where there's the famous uh, statue of the Black Madonna yes. and a beautiful uh, cathedral there. I was lucky enough to visit that town uh, in November of 2015, where I visited with Robert Hinshaw at oh, yeah. Iman Verlag, right? And you know Robert? I don't know him. I, I know of him. He was, of course, in Zurich when I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I know of him, but I don't really know him personally. Mm hmm and um, just in case anybody's not familiar, Diamond Verlag is another publisher um, mm -hmm. similar to Daryl Sharp's Inner City Books. And the Black Madonna uh, at in the cathedral is it's it's a big abbey. Um, you can actually yes. see it from the Diamond Verlag offices. The their windows face this enormous, gorgeous, beautiful cathedral. Just it's over the the memories of of that day that I spent there are just overwhelming. Jung spoke and lectured on Paracelsus. Is that how it's mm -hmm. pronounced? Paracelsus. Yeah, yes. he lived outside of Einsiedeln, uh, a, a few miles, let's say, mm -hmm. and um, 
And in Einsiedeln, there's uh, a, a drugstore, as you may know, in German is called an Apotec. Mm-hmm. And yes. there's a Paracelsus Apotec uh, just a half a block down from where I practice dentistry. <laughs> so Paracelsus is a name and a history that Einsiedeln is, is, appreciates very much. Yes. So you were practicing dentistry in the United States. and. Yes. You at some point became interested in Jung or in Jungian psychology. How'd that happen? Well, that's kind of an interesting story. At least it is for me. Yeah. Uh, I can you imagine what the state of Minnesota looks like? You're from Illinois, so maybe you can. But uh, it's north of Illinois, right? Yes. Minnesota. And on the right side of the state, if you're looking at a map, in other words, on the east side of the state, about two-thirds of the way down on the edge is the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Directly across the state from Minneapolis, about 13 miles from South Dakota, and now you're in the part of Minnesota, which is all corn and soybean country and hogs and so on, 13 miles from from South Dakota, due west of Minneapolis, is a small town called, um, <laughs> now my mind blinked on me. I'll come back to this. It's okay. Small town. This is, this, is, this is the way my mind works today. All of a sudden, I'll forget. Well, that town is where I practiced, de- began my dental practice. Okay. In that town. Um, and I had not known anything about Jung, Mm -hmm. never heard of him, was not paying attention to my, didn't feel my dreams were that important or anything like that. I was a dentist, uh, a rationalist, uh, a Lutheran raised in northern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in that town was a well-known poet who you may have heard of called Robert Bly. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, he grew up in that town. His father owned some farms, and he was living with his family on a farm. And he became my dental, uh, uh, one of my dental patients, he and his wife. So I met completely unexpectedly Robert Bly. Now, his understanding and view of many things in life were completely unfamiliar to me including, let's say, the value of, of uh, poetry. I was, I mean, I, I didn't devalue poetry, but I knew really nothing about the world of poetry. Um, and the value of dreams. And he knew of, of, of C.G. Jung. Mm-hmm. So it was the, it was the ex- unexpected coming into my life of Robert Bly that introduced me to the value of the unconscious and the value of dreams. And that hit me like a ton of bricks in the chest. Yeah. And when I thought about that and started remembering my dreams, it soon became clear to me that's what I have to do. Mm-hmm. And that began began the, the period of my life for the next eight years or so of going periodically. First, I had to go to Switzerland with my family for the first time, and then we returned again for about a year, and that got me my foot into the door of a, as a student at the Jung Institute in Zurich. Then we returned uh, back to Minnesota, and then I would go back and forth once or twice a year for a month again, to stay in the program until finally I returned long enough to complete the program and get my degree in 86. That is such a huge commitment. I mean, I can't imagine uh, most people making that sacrifice. And so this was in the late 70s, early 80s. And was it the case that there was nowhere in the United States to train to become a Jungian analyst at that time? No, that wasn't that wasn't uh, the case. That in fact, there was a uh, training program in Minneapolis, and I knew an analyst or two uh, had met an analyst or two that were, was functioning in that training program. But uh, 
I knew I wanted to go to Switzerland and study at the Jung Institute. Yeah. That I knew. And, um, and so that's how it began. And eventually I went and eventually I, I was able to get a work permit to work as a dentist. And I, I got a position, uh, as I mentioned, in this little town of Einsiedeln working for a, a dentist and uh, was able to spend my time between Zurich at the Jung Institute and Einsiedeln as a dentist and finally completed everything in uh, 76. I think I landed in Hartford, Connecticut in the fall of 76, had, having never set foot in Connecticut before, not to mention, of course, Hartford. So, it, And I was not married anymore at that time. So that was the beginning of a completely new life for me. Yeah. And I also, once I found an apartment and started to have a small practice, I, I urged my son, who was now a senior in high school, to come to Hartford and live with me. And he did. And he's still living in Connecticut, uh, down by the shoreline, uh, in Hamden, and with his three sons. So <laughs> it's as if it really was as if there was a force behind my life that changed it, yes. and I had to respond to it, and what wanted to, not knowing, you know, what was going to happen. And I think that, in a way feeds my work with the people I see. Mm -hmm. um, we can't be foolish, but at the same time, we can't be afraid of the future. And we have to trust our feelings, even if the logical mind says, but it doesn't make sense. Right. It might make sense. Everybody thought I was crazy to leave dentistry and become what? A, a Jungian analyst? Who's Jung? That was the response I got everywhere. And I can't blame them because five years or ten years earlier, I wouldn't have known who Jung was. And so how did you handle that kind of criticism from the people around you? Um, the Maybe the disapproval? You listened to your inner voice instead yeah. of what you were hearing on the outside. How did, well, you, how did you manage that? I mean, I, I hear that a lot. Um, the people don't have the strength to to do that. They feel that they're disappointing their family or <clears throat> disappointing their friends or won't have <clears throat> their approval anymore. Yeah. Well, to some degree, I experienced that. Um, my mother was still alive when I returned from Switzerland. Um and my stepfather and relatives who were in Minneapolis, they didn't understand what I did at all. And some were critical of it. Some were just, well, that's Jim, and let's see what happens. So there were people who didn't understand it. And, uh, and I'm sure there's people today, if I tell them that story, they can't understand why I went from one profession to the next. But we're talking really about the power of the soul and you have to respond to what's happening inside of you. And I've, of course, I, I've been here now since, since, uh, I think 86 is when I landed in, in, um, Connecticut from Zurich. So I've been here for quite a few years and the friends I have now are the people who know me as an analyst mm -hmm. and re and value that. But I don't know if anybody uh, has the luxury of going through their life without having to make some choices that others aren't going to understand. A simple divorce, not that that simple, could be a, something that uh, shocks one friend or relative and is accepted by another. So life, life is full of these kinds of challenges, right. that's for sure. Right. And my question to you about that is, how yeah. do you know when you have a thought or a feeling or an urge that that is the voice that you need to be following? 
and that it isn't some other voice, a should, a saboteur, some yeah. part of you that's yeah. out to destroy yeah. you. Oh, that's a very good question. And, um, well, I'm sure you have this experience because everybody has this experience. Some things ring true to us immediately. Some things don't. So mm-hmm. there, there's that phenomenon of how does it feel to me? But then also, uh, uh, encouraged by my meeting of Bly, I began to become very interested in my dreams. So my dreams, as far as I could tell, were on the one hand criticizing me for my enormous unconsciousness, and on the other hand, they were hinting all the time uh, of Jung psychology and Switzerland. Mm. So I had dreams that were definitely supporting me in the direction of Jung. I can tell you one if you'd like to. Yeah, absolutely. Know one. This was a very early on dream. I was with Jung and another woman. Uh, I, 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 if I remember the dream correctly now, the, young, the woman was there because of, uh, apparently she knew me in some way, I think. But, um, but she wasn't from reality. And whatever relationship we had was not emphasized in the dream. The, the main point is that we were, she was with me and we were with Jung. Mm-hmm. And Jung took us out into the deep water. Uh, and there we swam out, and then he had us dive down to the depths of the water. And there he took us into a, a uh, underwater cave. And in the cave, he lit a light. He somehow had a source of light, and it illuminated the walls of the cave. And on the walls of the cave was mythological images from ancient past and he said now your task is to understand these images so a dream like that coming very early in my transition from uh, dentistry to wanting to be an analyst and if I remember correctly that dream came even before my first trip to Switzerland told me that somehow I've got to pursue this interest in Jung, regardless of where it takes me. Mm -hmm. Well, so dreams are important, as we know. And so your relationship with Robert Bly that sort of opened this up to you, this this whole other world, did you continue that relationship with him? Oh, did I maintain it? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, While I was practicing dentistry in Minnesota. Now, this was back in the 60s and the 70s, -hmm. and Robert at that time was an extremely well-known poet and was traveling all over the country giving various uh, poetry talks and so on. I I would often uh, take a few days or a week off and go with him. Mm I, I didn't participate in any presentation he was me- making or poetry reading, but we just enjoyed each other and traveling together. Mm-hmm. And again, it was such a completely way of experiencing life and understanding life than I had ex- than, than was I had experienced, let's say, growing up in this town of 600 people in northern Minnesota. I had no connection with that kind of life or that kind of of, uh, culture that he was introducing me to. And we talked, of course, about many things, our personal lives, our personal problems, and so on. So we maintained a very good friendship. And um, it wasn't until I really got settled here in, in Connecticut uh, and his traveling began to decrease as far as going to different places in the, in the country and giving poetry readings, that we sort of lost connection with each other. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so we made a, a, I renewed the connection, in fact, just uh, a, a couple weeks ago. But he's, he's now 91 years old. Yeah. And he, his memory has 
has uh, deteriorated considerably. So he's he is in a different place in his life than he was when we were running around the country together. Yeah. And just for people who don't know, what is his connection with Jung? Oh, I think his connection with Jung is his relationship and interest to the psyche mm-hmm. and his own dreams. So for him, it was not unusual to want to remember a dream and understand it. In fact, I would say it's from him where that first um, idea came to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would often share a dream with him when I was still living in it, Madison, Madison, Minnesota. <laughs> this is the town that I used to practice in. Uh, we would we would share our own dreams whenever it felt possible or whenever we were together. So so the importance of dream came to me from him, and I think it came to him partly because of the artistic genius that lived in him and also because he uh, read Jung. Mm -hmm. He later went on to have a collaboration with Marion Woodman, didn't he? That's also right, exactly. And of course, she became a Jungian analyst. So, so it's, to me, it's, it's, it's a very interesting life that, uh, opened up to me when I finished dental school and moved to Madison, Minnesota, and unexpectedly met Robert Bly, Mm -hmm. and unexpectedly met Jung. Right, right. And you said that you knew you wanted to train in Switzerland as opposed to staying there right in your home state of Minnesota. And That's right, yeah. Yeah, and I'm very curious about that because... For me, with this podcast, my interest before I started it and when I was thinking about what I wanted it to be is I wanted to go to the roots. I wanted Mm -hmm. to go to the people who, now I think that the generation who knew Jung and trained with Jung directly are not here anymore, but the people who trained with them, the people who trained with the people who knew Jung? Well, I think that was in my mind also. I wanted to go where I could have training from people who who uh, lived and trained while Jung was still alive and still had uh, some influence on the Jung Institute. Right. And so... So Marie-Louise von Franz was still alive and still practicing and still teaching at the Jung Institute. For instance, mm-hmm. and did you? What was your relationship with her? Oh, I took some classes with her. I also took an, an, my fine, one of my final exams with her. Mm-hmm. So, I, personally, I had no say uh, non-professional relationship with her, but I certainly knew who she was and experienced her. And so, who were some of the other people that you? Uh, were, were your instructors or your training analysts? Oh, well, let's see. I don't know who I could mention that you would have heard of. Uh, there was a Dr. Amon who was one of my first analysts, and he he trained with uh, Emma Jung. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was my one of my training analysts also. You were in and amongst people who knew Jung and trained with Jung, and that is something that I fear is being lost today, is that, Uh, right, is that there, people come at me with these comments about how they have to take Jung's work and expand upon it, and my thinking is that we still need to understand what Jung said, and I know the Philemon Foundation is still continuing to publish his unpublished works. Mm-hmm. I know I mention this all the time. Most of his writings have yet to be published. And speaking of Marie-Louise von Franz, mm-hmm. who was 
a student of his who was analyzed by him, who was, who had be, become a collaborator with Jung up until his death. I was just recently listening to an interview with her done by Suzanne Wagner at the Jung Institute in Los Angeles. And well, that I, must have been some time ago, huh? Yes, it was in the 70s huh. it was recorded. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things von Franz said about Jung, she said he was an exceptional man. And mm-hmm. to her, he was the size of someone like Lao Tzu, you know, very rare, a sort of man born every 2,000 years in history. And so one couldn't compare oneself to him. Um but rather try to learn from him. And he he had enormous dimensions, which we don't understand yet, which yeah, he yeah. understood. But I we... think Edinger refers to Jung as an epical person, mm-hmm. the kind that comes once in an epic. Yes. For a purpose. To, to bring something to the culture and to the individual that is missing. And that's what I want to talk to Jungian analysts about on this podcast. So uh-huh. what if you would share with us what your thoughts are around that? Well, I, I agree with what you said in your quote from von Franz. And, um, and I think a person can have an introduction to Jung, or how one meets uh, Jung, so to speak, like me in the little town on the western edge of Minnesota, by meeting somebody who was interested in Jung. Our introduction to Jung can come in many ways, but I think it's important that one reads Jung, if one is interested in Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm which doesn't say that other people who are writing don't have something to offer. And, of course, von Franz is very good. Edward Eniger is very good. Those are two very important uh, sources of having experience in understanding Jung's relationship to the psyche and what it can mean for the individual. And, of course, I I would also urge that people read Jung if they're interested in Jung. I mean, how else do you really begin to know what Jung is saying unless you read Jung? And Memories, Dreams, Reflections is a wonderful volume to begin with if if a person is interested in discovering what Jung had to say and what some of the experiences in his life were were like that encouraged him to understand life the way he did and to understand the psyche he the way he did uh you i'm sure have you read memories dreams oh yes yeah so you know what that book's like and you know that that if you read it you also get a, a taste of jung's dreams um so the important thing is where is the individual coming from in their interest in Jungian psychology? From what depth is it coming to them, to consciousness, uh, the interest in Jung? And that, in a way, is almost a fateful question. Many people can hear, can hear of Jung. That doesn't mean they respond to it. Mm-hmm which isn't necessarily a criticism of anybody. There has to be something that becomes awakened by, by the individual when the name Jung comes up. And that awakening could occur even if the person had never heard of Jung, but whatever was way they, they were introduced to the idea of this man touched them in some way. And then the question is, do I follow that flame that's been touched to see where it might want to lead me? And that, again, I say is almost as much a fateful decision as an ego decision. I would say even more so. Yes, like what you experienced. 
Yes, and it has nothing to do with the ego's value. I was a, I had nothing, I had no knowledge of of psychology or dream or dreams when I heard heard about you. So my ego played no role in in creating that uh, introduction. That's for sure. But I trusted my feelings, and it came to me in the form of somebody who who also impressed me greatly. So it's it's very interesting how thing, these things work, and the same way as we experience it in our practices. One person can come, and they become very interested in their dreams, and they become very interested in Jung, and they decide they want to start reading more, and another person uh, does not respond that way. They may get what they want, but it doesn't last as long as, say, a work where the person really wants to discover what their unconscious wants from them. And you're talking about the people who come to you for analysis. That's right. And now, the, most of the time, the people who come to me know I'm a, I'm a Jungian analyst. Whether they know what that means or not is another question. But they generally know that I, generally they, they have, there's a reason why they found out about me, and one of them is that I work with dreams. Would you tell us a little bit about the importance of Jungian analysis as opposed to just reading Jung? When does the analysis become necessary or the correct choice for a person to make? Because it's something that I'm always encouraging is for people to enter analysis. I'm not trying to convert people, Mm -hmm. if that's the right word, or convince people to read Jung. What I'm out here trying to say is, if you're interested in Jungian psychology, then please go straight to the source. Please go to Jung. For instance, just this week, somebody Mm -hmm. that I'm following on Twitter quoted Jung, and I thought, that's not right. So I searched the collected works, and it was a mangling of, of a sentence in the collected works. And he attributed it to Jung, you know, but without a citation. And that's why I got to a point where I refuse to quote Jung without a citation. So I always put where I found the quote. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I started this podcast over three years ago, and I do hear from people all over the world, and most of them are not in Jungian analysis. And they ask me for things that I can't help them with. They need to be working with somebody one-on-one. And one of the criticisms I got when I started this podcast from analysts is that, well, you know, we only work with people one-on-one. We don't speak to the masses. And my thinking is Jung is going to die out unless there are people out there talking about him because we're not interacting face to face as much anymore. We're not having these conversations with people out in our neighborhood, on the street, in libraries, in schools, in meetings. Everybody's at home in front of their computer for the most part. So this information has to be available online. Otherwise, it's going to disappear. And that's what I'm trying to do is help keep this alive. So my question to you, with you being a Jungian analyst is, why do you feel Jungian analysis is important? Why is it relevant? Why is it necessary or needed? Because I believe it is. Well, I think it is also. Um, And of course, as you know, there are many other forms of psychotherapy, if we want to use that word, um, that people can, counseling and so on, that people can become involved with, that can help them. So to me, the real importance of the analysis, if we try to separate that from the other forms of psychotherapy, I'm going to use that as Mm an umbrella term now, which has importance, is that it's 
Jungian analysis, gen uh, generally anyway, that involves the discipline of recording dreams and, and then the, the attempt to try to understand the dreams because the dream is an expression of the soul. And at some point, a person's therapy or the, the new answer they need in life to help them take the next step is going to be is going to come one that is going to come from a source that is a compensation to their ego's understanding. Mm -hmm. And that means it's going to come from the unconscious and, and we could say it's going to come from the soul. So the importance to me in Jungian, anal in Jungian analysis is, is that it, it is the one form of psychotherapy that emphasizes remembering dreams and understanding them because they are the, the voice of our soul. And it's the soul that unites the opposites within the psyche with consciousness. And so where does the analyst come in? Why is the analyst necessary? Because another thing I see is people try to analyze their own dreams or each other's. And if you have a friend trying to analyze your dreams for you, someone who has not been analyzed, and they're bringing in their own psychology, their own associations, and I just don't see that as being the best way to go about it well see this it's it's all it's it's all very what should we say there is no law that covers it all so as you know because i'm sure you've experienced it like i do one can get the answer they need to a question from your best friend or from somebody else because they happen to have experience or it touches something in them and they say, I think maybe this would help you. Try this. And this might not, not be necessarily a question that involves psychotherapy. But the answers to our questions in life can come from many, many sources. But Jung's, I think, one of Jung's great gifts to the field of psychology is the value of the unconscious. That the unconscious has a source of wisdom that comes from a different place than the ego. Mm -hmm. And thus, for Jung, the whole, one of the main ideas is the union of opposites. The unconscious is one opposite. Ego consciousness is the other opposite. And the unconscious, generally, the information we get from the unconscious is a compensation to the information that our ego has. And it's that compensation that is so important. And so a Jungian analysis has the advantage of having, of being a source to bring the compensation of the unconscious into the person's therapy. Now, the ego of one person can have an idea that provides a, an important compensation to the ego of another person. That's also true. But the unconscious, its source comes from a deeper level. And having that view of our life uh, that symbolic view that is an attempt to unite the opposites within the unconscious is exceedingly important. And I don't know of any therapy, if we're talking about psychotherapy now, mm -hmm. other than different forms of yoga and other things, that are all attempts to unite the opposites within us. But the dream therapy is an attempt to bring to the person's consciousness the view of their life from one of or one part of their life or one aspect of their life from the unconscious and not from the ego. That's what we need. 
So you're talking about the problem of the opposites, which is what, mm-hmm. what Jung called it, and, yes. and working with that. And that is not an easy thing to do. That's not an easy thing to do, no. <laughs> right. So with not the help, ha- right, right. Well, with the help of an analyst who can see what we can't see, we can't really see ourselves. We can't see all of ourselves. Well, I was going to give you an example of this of this problem of the opposites. I mean, that can that can occur in in many ways. But um, a couple of years ago, there was an article in the Hartford Current, the newspaper here, mm-hmm. describing with a photograph. It had a picture of two neutron stars that collided millions of miles away in outer space. And these neutron stars uh, are, are the, the byproducts of that collision. It, the article says produce heavy elements such as gold and platinum and uranium and so on. And those elements are so heavy um, a teaspoon of neutron star stuff created from a collision, mm-hmm. a, teaspo- a teaspoon weighs around a billion or so tons. Yeah. So I, I, I find articles like this interesting, yeah. and I brought it into uh, a person's analysis just because I knew this person would be interested in, in reading something like this. All right. Uh, shortly after that, sh- this person, she has a dream. I cannot remember very much of the dream. I was hiking deep in tropical forest. I was struck by unusual rock. It was in a parallelogram shape. The colors were deep blood red, swirled with dark forest green. It looked like it was clay, but upon touch, it was another substance. It was molten Mm. and still hot to the touch, this newly formed lava. It had a metallic quality, and it seemed to have a glow and not to have come from Earth. (laughs) Now, that's, that's this woman's dream shortly after we read and talked a little bit about this neutron star explosion. Mm -hmm. It's as if a piece of molten material from outer space hit her in the stomach. But the question is, what does that piece of hot molten material from from outer space represent? Well, certainly we could say naively, well, it's the opposite of anything from her personal life, that's for sure, and even from the atmosphere in which we live. So the opposites were emphasized in her dream as really being something from a different world, so to speak. That's the kind of understanding one doesn't get in psychology that doesn't take advantage of the unconscious unless a synchronicity occurs in the outer world to bring that understanding in. That there is another dimension to the psyche just as unknown as that neutron star element, which then appeared in a dream and hit my dreamer in the stomach, and it was still warm. Now, what that neutron star element means practically for the dreamer is something that will continue to uh, will have ideas about as dreams go on and experiences go on. But the main thing is it really stresses to a person who has a dream the reality of the archetypal psyche, mm-hmm. if they're capable of accepting that reality. If they, and I know when I say capable, I don't mean that it has nothing to do with the intelligence in a way or the honesty. But it's if they have the fate to have to accept the reality of the archetypal psyche, a dream like this can be just what pushes them over the edge and says, "Well, what? 
I have to try to understand this. Right. And see what it means in my life and see what other dreams are going to say. So that to me was, uh, I was as surprised as, as she was from that dream, but it was a real synchronicity. We talked about this outer space material and how heavy a teaspoon of it is, mm-hmm. a billion tons or more. And shortly after that, she has a dream where something hot from outer space hits her in the tummy, which would be, I don't know what, what could we say, an archetype, something uh, that is certainly not of her conscious world um, and from her uh, personal life at all, but Mm -hmm. something that comes from the deep past, the deep past that is still alive and still has meaning. I give you that example because it's an example of of how the opposites can be expressed uh, by the self when that understanding is needed by the individual and the person uh, has the capacity to be touched by the wonder of it. This dream has a wonder to it. (laughs) Right. And I think where the difficulty comes in with people who maybe are are not in analysis or not doing this work is they'd have that dream and then do nothing with it. Yes. Right. But still struggle and look for answers, not find them, and then turn to these quick fixes. But... If it opens a door in the person, you mm-hmm. see, a dream like that could can be enough to, to, if it's their fate, to yes. say, all right, I've got to start reading Jung or somebody you know who's who has real uh, understanding of Jung's psychology and find out more about this business about the consciousness and the and the archetypal unconscious because something's going on in me. So a dream like that can be what pushes a person to take the leap into exploring an area of their relationship to their psyche that they never knew existed. But but something in them produced this dream. Mm -hmm. And And they didn't experience the dream as being just nonsense, but something I don't understand at all. And how the hell is it related to my life? That's a big right. question. How right. is it related to my life? Right. So why is Jung important to our times? Why do we want to, and I believe you do, not speaking for you, but I believe that it's as important to you as it is to me as far as keeping yeah. Jung alive and this work alive, because my fear is that because we live in such a quick fix society, where everybody's looking for an easy answer or doesn't want to even address the question. And we're being told if we're paying attention to mainstream media, which I try not to do, but I don't think that there's really any way to avoid it completely, that there is a pill for everything, or there is a quick new method or modality to fix what ails you. And like you had mentioned a little bit ago about other forms of psychotherapy, yes, they can help people, but do they, does that, does that change last? Is it a temporary change or is it real change? It depends on what the person needs. Mm. And it depends on this unknown thing we call fate uh, that will determine if she if she or he needs something how will she or he discover the beginning of where to find it Mm -hmm. and if it's a person's fate to have to begin to consider dreams seriously they'll start having dreams that they don't understand and are surprising the hell out of them. And if that's their fate, they Mm -hmm. may eventually uh, uh, 
from some unexpected place, get a rock in the stomach that says, read Jung. Yeah. And so they'll be led to Jung one way or another. Mm -hmm. But it has to be their fate, even though they may not use that word and may not uh, use it for quite a, for a long time. But it has to be, let's not use the word fate for a minute. It has mm -hmm. to be a necessity determined by the soul. And the, the soul, we could say, is the aspect of the transcendent that lives within each individual. And here I'm using the word transcendent rather than God, because that gets us out of, out of uh, the problem of religious uh, yes. dogma. And that is a large part of Jungian psychology, which I unfortunately try to avoid, both on this podcast and on social media. Um, uh -huh. People have different definitions of what God is, and I don't want to get into arguments with people about what God is, but no. that is a very important part of this. I just want to make sure that we've covered why Jung is important today. You know, Jung lived from 1875 to 1961, and because we live in this high-tech world now, my fear is that people see him as this, you know, crazy old man, which unfortunately I think that there was a campaign out there by the Freudians to paint him as especially when the Red Book came out and people were saying and actually writing to me about his, that Jung was psychotic. And one of the things that you teach, the seminars that you give are centered around the Red Book. And I was curious Absolutely. as to, yeah, I was curious as to why you chose that and have devoted several years to lecturing on the Red Book. Well, because in the first place, I, I, I value Jung and have valued Jung and, and his understanding and his writings, as you know now, for many years. Mm -hmm. And so when the Red Book came out, I had a sense that it was going to be a description of the experiences that led who led him to develop his psychology mm -hmm. in the form that it, his mature psychio, psychology became. So that you could say his entire collected works, except the volumes, let's say right around the early volumes, right around the time when, when he was, was meeting and working with Jung, with Freud, the entire collected works have their source in his Red Book experiences. And that is a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, his experience of the archetypal psyche of his soul, of the transcendent, that came to him from 1913 to what, 1917, 18, those experiences, and of course experiences that of, the, of the psyche of, of patients, is, is what he used to formulate the understandings that make up of the psyche that make up the Red Book or make up the collected works. Mm -hmm. So to me, reading the Red Book is getting at the source of the collected works and, there, and also the source of our own psyche. I don't think, so anybody that's really interested in Jung, um, the Red Book at some point should become part of what they're reading, mm -hmm. I would say. Not right away, because it's difficult. Yes. Memories, dreams, or, or, or uh, there are many other people that one, that one can read before they get to something like the Red Book. But at some point, the Red Book should be included in the reading because it describes so clearly how his unconscious was insisting that he become conscious of certain things. Just like the little boy who had the dream when he was four that he had to go down, that to follow the hole down into the ground. And there he came to an underground temple. And on the, uh, on the, uh, 
altar inside that temple was this huge living phallus, Mm -hmm. naked phallus, and the top of the phallus had a bright light shining out of it. That's Jung's dream when he was four years old, three years old. That was the beginning of his introduction to the archetypal psyche. Yeah. And he, and that, so it was his fate to have that dream, even though he didn't understand it. But he was able to accept it in a way that was a source of meaning and encouragement for him his entire life. The phallus is what uh, is is also suggested of the serpent. And it's the serpent, or we could say phallus, that Mm -hmm. told Eve to tell Adam to eat from the tree of knowledge. So that wisdom of the tree of knowledge that unites the opposites comes from below. And that understanding runs through all sorts of religious, uh, different religions and philosophies in the world. The need to go below to get at the truth. And it's a compensation to Christianity, which became uh, the God of light and purity and innocence and all that. And there's a place for that, but there's also a place for having to go into the depths and find what unites above and below. And Jung had that experience at four years old. Yeah. <laughs> he went below and found the God that lives below. And the rest of his life, in a certain way, was uniting the meaning of the God that lives below with the God that lives above. Yeah, what does that get us when we unite the opposites? What is the purpose of that? Is that about wholeness? I would say wholeness, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that we're not split. So or that one, we're not split. Or one-sided. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And what happens when we are personally, as a culture, one-sided? Well... Half the world is unconscious to us, for one thing, in one way or another. Half the world represents fear to me in one way or another. Half the way people live I can't accept for one way or another. I cannot accept my friends, my wife, my husband, my children, if they aren't doing what I think they should do. And then I need a good stiff drink at the end of the day to help me relax or to take uh, antidepressants or all the other things we do to try to unite the opposites unconsciously Mm -hmm. to reduce the tension. We try to unite the opposites unconsciously. Unconsciously. That's what the highball does at the end of the day. And we, can, we all enjoy that, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, until we reach the, de- point, the point where we're dependent on the highball or the Valium or whatever it is. Yeah. And I just, I, I don't want to leave this out because this is also important, and my analyst would remind me of this constantly, and I would never, I never understood it when she said it. I'm like, what? I liked it, but I never understood it. And only now, decades later, am I understanding it. And it's about how when I would struggle with something and just be in all this pain because I'm just struggling and struggling and suffering. And she would think that was a good thing. It's a good thing that I was struggling. And I Uh thought, what the, what? (laughs) You need help. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So why does growth come only through struggle? Oh, boy. Well, maybe I shouldn't say why. I just I just need you to validate that for us, that the struggle, if we stay with it long enough, if we don't give in to one side or the other, if we keep holding the tension of the opposites, that it will lead us to something new, a new attitude, a new place? 
I think it's uh, I can't answer that question except by uh, <laughs> rambling here, but I think the human race is the one form of life on the earth that really has to struggle consciously with consciousness mm. and not uh, live completely by instinct. But we're the creature that has been given the task of reflection and from reflection finding new solutions and new experiences. That's our fate. So <clears throat> the less we reflect, the less reflection, of course, means trying to see what's shining back at you. Mm -hmm. And that's the opposite. So, so if I become, if I develop the habit of not reflecting, not asking questions, not wondering why I'm doing this or why he or she's doing that or why the world's doing this or why Trump is doing this and so on and so on, if I don't reflect, I lose the mirror and therefore I only see one side of myself. And that's the side that I want to see and I'm most used to seeing. Or the side that's always giving me a problem and I don't know what the hell to do about it. So, but if I put a mirror in front of me and start to reflect, then I see another part of myself. The opposite that I haven't been considering day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So the opposite, becoming conscious of the opposite, is like living through the, um, the benefit of always having a mirror where I can see myself from a different standpoint, from a different direction. And if I don't have that uh, advantage, then I'm, of course, tied to the same solution all the time. But there's something in the human psyche that is capable of and demanding of reflection and um, taking into consideration the opposite. So the, the problem of the opposite, I think, is really is, is also as old as the human race and mm -hmm. the great traditions in ancient cultures always had some way or another of expressing the problem of opposites. Either through mythological figures who represented opposite values and were in conflict with each other or would help each other or Lao Tzu or any of these other traditions always bring in the need of the opposite in their, in their um, understanding of the transcendent. And when you say the need of the opposite, and I just want to wrap this up with, it's not about swinging from one, one side to the other. No, one, one it's side trying of the to spectrum. avoid that. Yes, by, avoid that by, what do we do with these two opposites? Well, first we have to become aware of there's a problem that I don't have a solution to, and, it's, and, and uh, I need a solution because it's making my life difficult. Mm -hmm. So right away I know there is an opposite right there. Our, the problems in our life, whatever they are that we experience them from tiny ones to big ones, represent an opposite. And... I can't do anything about that opposite until I become conscious of it. And that brings me to the point where I have to start reflect. I have to reflect on myself. I have mm -hmm. to reflect on what I want. I, want to re I have to reflect on why I haven't been able to do what I want or why I don't like this person but like this person. And reflection, we could say from the psychological appointment is 
looking back, looking back at oneself to see what's behind me, to see what I've done and how did it turn out. So to bring this all together and to bring Jung into our present day, into the present time, how can the work of Jung help us with what we are experiencing, not just as, as a society, but as a world today? All this outrage. <laughs> oh, that's a big question. All this division. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What popped into my mind is something that Jung once said. Consciousness and helping consciousness is like uh, helping society with an epidemic and if society is suffering from a, an epi- a disease that has is covering a huge portion of society as an epidemic will do you said you can only cure an epidemic one patient at a time mm-hmm. so society is going to change when enough people change And that's where I think Jungian psychology is very important because it's going to teach people to look at themselves and realize that themselves is the biggest problem. If they can change themselves, they have a new relationship to at least some portion of what's outside of them as well as what's inside of them. And that'll change their relationship to people. Very well put. Changing one patient, one person at a time is the cure for an epidemic. And it's also the cure for, let's say, a a psychotic epidemic or or a neurotic epidemic. Look at our country today. People are all behaving um, neurotically and taking drugs and raping and killing and uh, responding to their um, desires and their needs and their emotions unreflectively. They just, they're just responding in so many cases. And walking into buildings with guns and shooting walking and killing Walking into buildings with, gun, with guns. No reflection incapable of reflecting. Those are extreme cases, but we all ha- are, um, have suffer from those tendencies on a minor level. Yes. And uh, how many times can I say something unreflectively to my wife, let's say, or my friends, and then wonder afterwards, why did I say that? I know that I shouldn't have said that. Why did I say it? What came up that pushed me to say that? If I'm lucky, I'll have a dream that may help me with that. What I hear a lot of people say is, well, I didn't mean it. And, yes. that, and that it ends there. And that always makes me cringe, this, well, I didn't mean it, or somebody else apologizing for that person saying, well, she didn't mean it. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Some part of her did, or him, did mean it, and he's not conscious of that part. Yeah. And so that part will stick its hand in that person's life more often than he or she realizes it. And still, most likely, think the cause of it is outside of him or her rather than within him or her. This is why this podcast exists for statements like that. Thank you for sharing that and for putting it that way. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been a good uh, hour or so. We've covered a lot. (laughs) Is there anything? Yeah. So just to wrap up here, is there anything that we haven't covered? Well, right now I can't think of anything. We, We covered so much and yet we kept working around the idea of the opposites. Yes. 
and becoming conscious of the opposite within ourselves. And that's the only way we really begin to heal ourselves. And when enough people do that, the this society begins to heal. But if if we avoid that in ourselves and if society generally avoids it in itself, then society doesn't heal and the nation doesn't heal and the world doesn't heal. Well, I'd like to thank you for your time today, Dr. Shearer. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed here today. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or to download for free. This podcast is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your shows. You can help support this podcast at no extra cost to you by shopping online at Amazon.com just by clicking on any book link on the website. A caveat at this time being that Amazon is currently not shipping titles from Inner City Books, so please visit innercitybooks.net directly. They offer free shipping throughout North America. You can also support this podcast at no extra cost to you by registering for the online video courses offered by the Young Society of Washington, D.C., that you can start any time, go at your own pace, and have lifetime access to the materials. Please visit the donation page for more information. With very special thanks to J. Gary Sparks and to Daryl Sharp and Liz Jefferson at Inner City Books, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.